You've heard of keto and carnivore, but what if I told you the latest trend is sugar? Ever wondered if piling on simple carbs from fruits, juices, and honey could burn more fat, boost energy, and improve metabolic health, all without cutting calories? Welcome to the 2025 sugar diet trend, a high carb, low fat, low protein plan. But is the hype real or just tales from fit enthusiasts? This is lecture 111 of the Metabolic Classroom. Looking to improve your own metabolic health? Visit InsulinIQ.com for courses, coaching, consultations, and a 10-day free community membership trial. To dive deep into the science behind metabolic health, become an insider at BenBickman.com. Today, we're exploring the sugar diet, a trend that has gained an enormous amount of tension here in the year 2025. Okay, so first of all, what is the sugar diet? Well, it's not contrary to popular opinion, a person just eating spoonfuls of sugar. Based on recent discussions online and reports, and indeed these anecdotes, it is, to say it another way, a very high carbohydrate, low fat, and low protein diet. And it emphasizes simple sugars as the main energy source. Now, that means not that it emphasizes spoonfuls of table sugar, but rather it includes fruits, juice, fruit juices, honey, and sometimes things like sugar or even some candies or sugary beverages. But that's not the main part of it, mostly. It really is generally these simple sugars from things like fruits and juice and honey. As I noted, fat intake is very often quite low, below 10% of calories, so that's just a few grams a day. And protein, interestingly, is also very minimized. This is often also less than about 10% of the total calories per day. So that's important. So it's a very high carb, very low fat, very low protein diet. And it's that latter part, the low protein, that is a little peculiar given the profile, as we'll get to in a bit, of many of the advocates for the so-called sugar diet. And these advocates, these proponents, suggest that you consume these foods very freely without strict calorie limits, and they cite their own evidence and their own findings that it will support fat loss, that it does maintain muscle, and it boosts energy by favoring this blood sugar metabolism or glucose metabolism. Now, the whole reason I am even taking time to discuss this is because it has become such a popular phenomenon. In fact, I'm even a little late to the game where this approach has spread through social media platforms like YouTube and Instagram, et cetera, where individuals document these short-term experiments showing remarkable weight loss and really great athletic physical performance. However, it lacks any sort of formal endorsement, and it appears to really be more of a self-experimentation trend rather than any sort of formal scientific approach. Now, from a metabolic viewpoint, the heavy reliance on sugar <clears throat> certainly for me raises concerns about sustained insulin elevation, which as you know, having connected with me before, the more a person is spiking their insulin and keeping it elevated, the more that will promote insulin resistance. Now, we're going to get into mechanisms more in a moment, but I wanted to provide a historical context because this isn't quite as novel an approach as you might think it is. So for that context, the sugar diet, so-called, shares remarkable similarities with the rice diet developed by Dr. Walter Kempner at Duke University in the 1930s. The rice diet was intended very deliberately for patients with severe hypertension and kidney disease and heart failure. And that's because heart disease was the main concern at the time and coincidentally is still the main leading cause of non-infectious death within the United States and much of the world. So, but at the time, these were conditions that were really difficult to manage, and let's face it, they still are with bad information. But the rice diet consisted primarily of white rice, but also fruits, fruit juices, and even some added sugars um, for getting more calories and just making it taste good. And this diet was about 90% uh, carbohydrate. 
less than 5% of it was coming from fat. And as you can just do the math, about 5% of it would be coming from protein. So this was perhaps a more extreme version of the what we call the sugar diet. It was so high in carbohydrate. Now, there was a little bit difference there also where they deliberately restricted sodium, and it was often calorie limited. They would want you to control the calories, you know, just to around that 2,000 calories per day. Now, Kempner's studies had he, – he reported data on thousands of patients noting significant improvements in things like blood pressure. Um, you know, hypertension – in hypertensive patients, average blood pressure drops really were pretty remarkable, and they noted even reductions in things like obesity. But, of course, the diet was challenging to follow. Uh, you would only adhere to it when you were living within this facility, um, but it was difficult to adhere to because of the monotony. And let's face it, in a point I will make later – some of the nutrient deficiencies that would start to potentially creep up. Modern analyses of the rice diet suggest that the success was partly due to the calorie restriction rather than saying that the person was eating a lot of carbs. Now, let me just play on that point for just a moment. I have stated before that with slow insulin resistance, and please go watch that previous metabolic classroom lecture where I discuss slow and fast insulin resistance. Slow insulin resistance is an insulin resistance that is, that is a result of an expanded fat cell or a hypertrophic fat cell. And there are two variables that drive the expansion, and thus these same two variables can be leveraged to reduce the size, and that is insulin and energy. And the more energy is brought down, the more insulin also will come down. And so that's a very important thing to note, that if a person is cutting back on their calories, even if they're still eating a lot of carbs, they're still eating less than what they were before, and so insulin will come down. All right. Now, so that was the rice diet in its in this historical view, and I can't help but see a lot of similarity that the sugar diet is simply the new version of the rice diet. So when we compare the two, they're both very high in carbohydrates from very refined or simple sources, very low in fat and very low in protein, and they're both really – targeting this improvement in metabolic health. That's what they're claiming. That's what they're trying to do. Now, the rice diet was medically supervised, um, and it had a lot of rest. It was a very sort of low physical activity um, diet as well, uh, or th the diet came along with strong encouragement to just rest and be somewhat sedentary, but there was a lot of monitoring. But the sugar diet has none of those kinds of things. There's no calorie restriction. And in fact, as we'll get to, it is really used by people who are very physically active, which I actually think is a bit of a confounding variable. Okay, so let's come back to the sugar diet. Um, direct studies on the sugar diet are not only limited, they're actually non-existent. Um, this is a very recent trend, and there's no randomized controlled trials that I'm aware of. Um, there are a lot of anecdotal reports, or not a lot. There are some strong anecdotal reports from a handful of people that do suggest short-term fat loss, uh, energy improvements, and physical performance enhancements. So these people are doing really well with their um, exercise. Drawing from related research, high sugar diets from fruits um, can – appear to offer some metabolic advantages in very active populations. But the overall literature on deliberately adding simple sugars to the diet is not good. Um, now, even as I'm going to – I think about this 2023, what's called an, an, an umbrella review. So a very, very big study covering dozens of other studies – it showed a lot of harms, um, like increased risk of um, heart disease, increased risk of type 2 diabetes. But even as I look at that big review, I can't make a direct comparison to the sugar diet because that is – those are review articles that are just looking at how much extra sugar people are eating in the midst of a lot of fat and a lot of protein. 
And so it's not a surprise that that's not a very fair comparison. And an advocate of the sugar diet would be very justified in pointing out that restriction. Across multiple studies, if you try to find evidence that looks at high sugar, you can't, you almost can't use that term in a way that the sugar diet advocates are using it, where it's a very, very high carb. In fact, that may be the better term for it. It should just be a high, simple carbohydrate diet because calling it the sugar diet does invoke this improper idea that it is just a person drinking more sugary soda or adding more sugar to their cake or something like that.